it's a it's a pleasure it's a pleasure to be welcoming you to this lecture in the state of democracy lecture series. It's our last one of the year, uh, and I want to uh, give a special shout out and thanks to the undergraduates who have uh, foregone the opening day of hot tub season on Euclid Avenue to, to be with us here today. Uh, I know it's a sacrifice. There, there, there is tomorrow, though. It's supposed to be even warmer then. Uh, I'm Grant Reher. I'm director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute. It's the institute that coordinates the series. And as I said, this is the last um, lecture for us for the academic year in the series, and we're going out on a particularly strong note. Now, I would say that we're going out on a high note, but this new book by Christopher Aiken and Larry Bartels titled Democracy for Realists um, is, from a political perspective, somewhat depressing. I ought to warn you. So uh, I'm hoping that they're going to give me the silver lining here in the next, in the next hour. Uh, my colleague, Shana Guderian, will have more to say about Chris and Larry and also our two faculty respondents in a minute. Uh, but I just want to note that uh, Larry and Chris and their book are, are really at the heart of the purpose of the State of Democracy lecture series because this is really first-rate scholarship. It's on an important topic that is central to citizenship, and it is extremely, extremely timely. So I want to thank uh, Shana Guderian, my colleague, for instigating their visit, and I want to thank the two of them uh, for coming to be with us. I also want to thank the Dean's Office for supporting the series and for technical support, the Information and Computing uh, Technology Group, and in particular, Tom Fazio. And thanks as well, and as always, to Bethany Wallowender and Kelly Coleman. They work in the Campbell Institute, uh, and they work quite hard, and they, they have helped immensely in putting together this series. Now, I have three reminders for you. The first one, the one you hear all the time, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you haven't already done so, please uh, silence your smartphones. And then when we get to the audience Q&A, which will be uh, the last part of the program here, I'd like to ask you if you're called upon to, uh, to pose a question or, or make a brief comment to wait for the microphone to come to you so that uh, not only other people can hear you, but you're also part of the archive that we make of these. Uh, and in addition, remember that once you're done with that, to give the microphone back. Okay. And then the third thing is to remind you that following the talk, we will have a very nice reception outside in the foyer. Uh, the book will be available, um, and the authors are, are willing to sign it if you like. And so please do stay for the refreshments and a continuation of the conversation. As we typically do in our State of Democracy lecture series, the format for today is going to be that we will hear from our two lecturers, the co-authors of the book, and then there will be two brief faculty responses. Following those responses, we'll open it up again for questions and very brief comments. So having said all that, um, let me turn it over now to my Campbell colleague, Shana Guderian. So I know the question on everyone's mind is, what do shark attacks have to do with democracy? And I think by the end of today, you will actually have an answer to that. So we're so pleased to welcome um, Chris Aiken and Larry Bartels to our State of Democracy speaker series. Uh, Chris Aiken is the Roger Williams Strauss Professor of Social Sciences and Professor of Politics at Princeton University. Larry Bartels is the May Worthen Shane Chair of Public Policy and Social Science at Vanderbilt University. And not on their, on their CVs is that um, they are also mentors of mine, and so I'm so glad to be able to share what I've learned um, about democracy and for students of mine who understand my somewhat pessimistic view of citizen competency once you listen to Chris and Larry. Um, in the book, Democracy for Realists, that they'll talk about today, they deploy a wealth of social science evidence, including original analyses of topics ranging from abortion politics and budget deficits to the Great Depression and shark attacks to show that the familiar ideal of thoughtful citizens steering the ship of state from the voting booth is fundamentally misguided. They demonstrate that voters, even those who are well-informed and politically engaged, mostly choose parties and candidates on the basis of social identities and partisan loyalties, not political issues. So after um, discussing their book, we're going to hear responses from two of our Maxwell colleagues. 
Um, Matthew Cleary is Associate Professor of Political Science at the Maxwell School. He studies elections, democratization, democratic theory, and ethnic politics with a focus on Latin America. And Elizabeth Cohen is also Associate Professor of Political Science at Maxwell, and she studies contemporary and mon modern political theory, history of political thought, immigration, and citizenship. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our authors. Thank you so much, Grant and Shana. Larry and I, uh, as she mentioned, got to, to know Shana when she was a graduate student at, uh, at Princeton. And uh, not only was she one of our smartest graduate students, but she was also one of the most humane and gracious, as I, everyone here has learned. And uh, we miss her, but Syracuse is, is very fortunate to have her. We also are, uh, are reminded, Larry and I, that this is the institution that taught Warren Miller, his, uh, the famous political scientist whose, degree was, whose graduate degree was from here. Warren invented the American National Election Study. He invented ICPSR, the data archive. And not only would this book have been impossible without his work, but our careers would have been as well. So it's a special privilege for us to uh, stand where, uh, in, in the precincts where Warren was, was once a graduate student and uh, to uh, honor, honor his memory. Well, the book uh, cover you can see above you uh, on the wall there, <coughs> it is decorated in Syracuse orange. Uh, <coughs> we insisted on that. Uh, <coughs> Larry said uh, that I should say that we change the colors at each place that we give a speech, but we don't. We insist on Syracuse orange everywhere. So this is the, this is the topic um, we have. So we had agreed that I would give this uh, talk today and, and not Larry. We rotate back and forth. But, uh, and, and part of the reason we did it was that um, my work is familiar here. This is an earlier uh, book a little booklet of mine uh, in, in the hands of Professor Guderian's son. And he's, <laughs> he's taking a look at it there and uh, seeing, seeing what he thinks about it. Un unfortunately, we also know what he did think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, we had seen people chewed up at public lectures before, but this seemed to be uh, uh, way too much. And so we've decided that since I have serious intellectual opponents here, that Larry would do the presentation instead. <laughs> thanks, Chris. And thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, this is a real honor to be here. Um, we want to start by thinking a little bit about the ideals that we suspect you've all absorbed in one way or another about democracy and the connection between those ideals and democratic realities. This is a kind of familiar way of thinking about that connection from the eminent political scientist Robert Dahl who wrote, no state has ever possessed a government that fully measured up to the criteria of a democratic process. None is likely to, yet the criteria provide highly serviceable standards for measuring the achievements and possibilities of democratic government. They can serve as guides for shaping and reshaping concrete arrangements, constitutions, practices, and political institutions. That is very much, I think, the way that political scientists think about these democratic ideals. But if you stop and ponder the idea, it really seems a little odd. Here's a kind of way of thinking about that that goes back more than a century um, to a book about human nature and politics. No doctor would now begin a medical treatise by saying the ideal man requires no food and is impervious to the action of bacteria, but this ideal is far removed from the actualities of any known population. No modern treatise on pedagogy begins with the statement that the ideal boy knows things without being taught them and his sole wish is the advancement of science, but no boys at all like this have ever existed. It seems as though those kinds of uh, weird Conjunctions between the ideals and the reality are really mostly how we're operating in the mode of democratic thought. And what we want to do is to take more seriously the possibility that the ideals are so divorced from realities that we really need to stop and rethink. And the ideal that we're talking about, what we're going to call the folk theory of democracy, uh, again drawing on Dahl's work uh, 
Uh, he writes at one point that popular sovereignty requires that whenever policy choices are perceived to exist, the alternative selected and enforced as governmental policy is the alternative most preferred by the members of the relevant political community. So people have preferences. The point of government is to somehow translate those preferences into policy, and the voters somehow manage to guide the ship of state from the voting booth. Uh, put more simply and even earlier, H.L. Mencken wrote, democracy is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. Uh, <laughs> We're questionable about whether the common people know what they want, and as a result, questionable about whether they deserve to get it good and hard. So here are some problems that we see with this spoke theory of democracy. One is the issue of logical indeterminacy. We have the idea that there are majorities out there that can simply be expressed in policy, but if you stop to think about that in detail, it turns out that it's very hard to imagine what a majority actually is, unless you've already defined a question in terms of a dichotomous yes-no uh, situation. But politics is so complicated and the relationship among issues and alternatives is so complicated that really it turns out to be quite difficult to even specify what it would mean to say that an alternative is preferred by the members of a political community. There's also psychological indeterminacy. If you think about the extent to which we as individuals have well thought out, logically consistent views about all the issues of policy that might come before us, uh, it's clear that that's not the case for most people about most issues. And political scientists and psychologists over the last half century have demonstrated that in really striking ways by looking at, for example, how people's attitudes are strongly shaped by minor details of the questions that they're asked or minor details of the context in which they're asked questions. If I ask you a question and there's an American flag somewhere in the room for you to look at, you'll give different answers than if there isn't. That seems to suggest that you don't have underlying concrete preferences that just have to be tapped, but that you're making things up as you go along. There's a lot of literature about political ignorance and some attempts to rescue citizens from this problem by pointing to heuristics and information shortcuts that they might use, but there are also lots of evidence suggesting that those heuristics and information shortcuts often lead people astray. And then finally, what we refer to as the illusion of issue voting, drawing on the work of another one of our former graduate students, Gabriel Lenz, who shows that people often vote in a way that seems to suggest that they're voting on the basis of issues, but in fact, if you look in detail at the formation of their preferences, uh, in most cases, it turns out that they decide who to vote for and then adopt the appropriate issue positions rather than having issue positions and using them to decide how to vote. And so political scientists have made a lot of this correlation between people's issue preferences and their, and their uh, voting behavior, but in a way that we think is deeply confused about the underlying causal process. So again, elections and the mirage of popular control. Um, this is a way of thinking about the implications of all those difficulties that I just pointed to. What I'm showing you here is the relationship between the preferences of constituents in each congressional district in the country as measured by their responses to a dozen different questions about concrete policy issues and the behavior of their elected representatives, of their House members voting on a bunch of stuff over a two-year period. You can see that there's some relationship between the preferences of the constituents and the behavior of the elected officials, but that difference, the slopes of those two separate lines that I'm showing you here are swamped immensely by the difference between Republicans and Democrats, even if they're representing constituents with identical policy preferences. So mostly it's clear from this picture, to us at least, that elections aren't constraining or disciplining elected officials to behave in one way rather than another. Once they're in Congress, they pretty much do what they want to do. What the Republicans at the top want to do is quite different from what the Democrats at the bottom want to do, and they mostly do it regardless of their constituents' views. <clears throat> There's another way of thinking about this in which we bypass the elected officials who may, for one reason or another, not be responsive to our preferences and make policy directly for ourselves. That turns out to create all kinds of difficulties as well, and so we have some analyses in the book of what happens if you leave it up to the voters to decide, for example, 
whether their fire departments should get budget increases or not. They save a little bit in tax money. The quality of the training and equipment of the fire departments goes downhill, and as a result, they get more fires. It's a kind of a instance of a broader problem in which people use referenda and initiatives to express their policy views, but in ways that are often self-defeating. So based on these kinds of problems, political scientists have, I think, largely backed away from the folk theory of democracy in terms of the way they as professionals think about what's going on here and turn to an alternative view in which what people are doing is not so much expressing their policy preferences, but rather simply making judgments about the quality of performance of incumbent <coughs> politicians. If things are going well, we reelect whoever's in charge. If things are going badly, we throw them out. As uh, V.O. Key once said, the electorate is a rational god of vengeance and of reward. So here's a quick introduction to that logic from an uh, important book by Mofi Arena from the early 1980s. He says, retrospective voters need not know the precise economic or foreign policies of the incumbent administration in order to see or feel the results of those policies. In order to ascertain whether the incumbents have performed poorly or well, citizens need only calculate the changes in their own welfare. If jobs have been lost in a recession, something is wrong. If sons have died in foreign rice paddies, something is wrong. If thugs make neighborhoods unsafe, something is wrong. If polluters foul food, water, or air, something is wrong. Now that's a kind of promising avenue to pursue in terms of how voters might hold elected officials accountable because it doesn't require them to have detailed policy preferences. It only requires them to know how things are going. And this saving grace or potential saving grace of democratic voters was fastened on by a lot of the scholars who did important early work in this area. Uh, here's Gerald Kramer from the early 1970s saying, election outcomes are not irrational or random or solely the product of past loyalties and habits or of campaign rhetoric and merchandising. Or V.O. Key's way of putting it, voters are not fools. So this is kind of the fallback position for most political scientists and was really what we had in mind as the fallback position when we began this project 15 years or so ago. Uh, but we found out along the way that retrospective voting is harder than it looks. And so here are the kinds of issues that we've been <coughs> wrestling with. Can voters reliably discern changes in their own welfare? If so, can they use those changes to ascertain whether the incumbents have performed poorly or well? And which aspects of voters' subjective well-being are plausibly attributable to incumbent leaders' policies or performance? If they can't tell whether things are going well or badly, or if things are going well and badly and they can't tell whether it's due to anything that the incumbents have actually done, then not surprisingly, the mechanism of accountability here is going to be quite weak. And here's a way of thinking about that that's just based on a little formal model that we presented in the book. Uh, what I'm showing you along the horizontal dimension here is the amount of noise basically in voters' assessments of the incumbents' performance. And the declining lines are showing you basically how effective they're going to be at electing the right person as a function of how much noise there is. And you can see that the quality of accountability here falls off pretty quickly in some circumstances as the amount of noise in their judgments increases. So that suggests that we as political scientists should spend a lot of time worrying about how much noise there is in those perceptions. But in fact, although people have recognized this point in the abstract, they've spent rather little time actually trying to figure out how good or bad citizens are at making these kinds of judgments. And so we have some little empirical projects that are intended to shed light on that. Um, one is the one that's already been mentioned about uh, shark attacks. So here's the coast of New Jersey in 1916, where there was over the course of about two weeks a series of fatal shark attacks. Got a lot of attention for those of you who've seen the movie Jaws. Uh, that was based on this set of events, although fictionalized in some ways. Um, and what we found is that in the parts of New Jersey, the communities along the Jersey Shore that were affected by these shark attacks and where the tourists stayed home in droves through the summer of 1916, the incumbent president, Woodrow Wilson, lost something like 10 percentage points uh, in the election of 1916 as a result, as best we can tell, of 
people being upset about the fact that the sharks had chased away the tourists. Now, if you stop and think about that, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Woodrow Wilson didn't have any control over whether the sharks were nibbling people on the beach. Uh, nevertheless, because things had gone badly, they translated that pain more or less directly into punishment of the incumbent president. Well, that's just the Jersey Shore in 1916. Uh, so then we looked at the entire 20th century and the relationship between climatic conditions and support for the incumbent president. And what we found was that voters routinely punish the incumbent party if their states are too wet or dry in the election year. That's especially true in rural places, uh, and it's especially true if the droughts and floods are in close temporal proximity to the election. But generally speaking, in most election years, if things are bad in terms of weather, uh, the incumbent party is going to do less well. Again, doesn't make any sense in terms of actual rational accountability, uh, but it's something that people seem to engage in pretty regularly. <coughs> there are also problems with how they assess the economic conditions themselves, not only who's responsible for them, uh, but whether things are going well or badly. Here's a summary of the relationship between presidential election outcomes in the post-World War II era and two explanatory variables that are really simple. One is how long the incumbent party has been in power. The longer they've been in power, the higher standards people tend to hold them to, the less easy it is to get reelected. So the Democrats, other things being equal, will have more trouble winning reelection in 2016 than they did in 2012. But the other big factor that's important here is economic conditions. And again, this is something that a lot of political scientists have studied over a long period of time. Most of them has thought of, about this relationship between economic conditions and the incumbent party's vote as being uh, a signal of the fact that voters are holding incumbents accountable for economic performance. But if you read the fine print here, the economic performance that they're being held responsible for is a six-month period leading up to Election Day. All the rest of economic performance over the incumbent's term in office it seems, as best we can tell, to have no effect at all. And so if you wanted to be systematically holding incumbents uh, accountable for whether the economy is good, you want to do it over the whole course of their administration or even over a series of administrations by the same party. These short-term retrospections uh, have a whole lot of noise in them. Here's what the picture looks like of those uh, quarter by quarter economic growth figures. You can see if you're trying to predict the overall, or trying to summarize the overall performance of any president on the basis of just uh, one or two quarter slice that you're gonna do very poorly in terms of actually figuring out whether they've done a good job. And so there are instances where presidents who performed rather poorly over most of their term get a lot of credit for an election year boom. Uh, Ronald Reagan is an example of that. There are also cases of presidents who've presided over a lot of economic growth through most of their term and then have a recession at the very end and get voted out as a result. So Jimmy Carter is an example of that. Well, <clears throat> maybe this is what people do in ordinary times, but if you face them with a big crisis, uh, they bear down and think more seriously and vote ideologically. The most well-known instance of this people point to uh, the New Deal period and especially, especially the election of 1936, which is generally interpreted as an endorsement of the important policy changes that Franklin Roosevelt instituted during his first term in office. Well, what we did is went back and looked at the patterns of voting in the 1936 election and found out that what was going on then seemed to be quite similar to what we show going on in contemporary elections, which is to say, in parts of the country where the economy was flourishing in the election year, Roosevelt gained votes by comparison with what he had done in 1932. And in parts of the country where the economy was in bad shape, he lost votes. People seemed to be voting in the same kind of short-sighted, myopic, retrospective way in 1936 uh, as in other years. And indeed, we have a little calculation that if the recession that hit in 1938 had hit in 1936 instead, Roosevelt would not have been reelected in the whole New Deal era, which is kind of a major turning point in the 20th century party system, uh, would not have happened at all. 
What happens if you look at other countries around the world where uh, different incumbents were in charge? It turns out that the pattern seems quite consistent, that whoever was in charge when the economy tanked got voted out of office and replaced with someone else. If the economy improved, then that someone else was in power for a long time afterward. If the economy didn't improve, then they got voted out and replaced with somebody else, somebody else, uh, more or less regardless of what kinds of policies they were pursuing. So in the US, we often think that Roosevelt adopted a set of policies that made sense in terms of dealing with the Depression, uh, and that that was why he was rewarded by the American public for the recovery from the Depression. But it turns out that in all different places around the world, all different people were in charge and got it voted out or in in more or less exactly the same way. So if the folk theory of democracy and the idea that people are voting on the basis of issues doesn't really work, and if retrospective voting is certainly powerful in terms of accounting for election outcomes, but not very powerful as a mechanism of accountability, what is it that's going on? Uh, here the analysis is more preliminary and open-ended, but what we wanna say is that mostly what's going on is that people are thinking about politics and acting in politics on the basis of groups and group identities. Here's a quotation from Madison from Federalist 10 that I think summarizes very well the way contemporary psychologists think about human nature. A zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and many other points, as well as speculation as a practice, have divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for the common good. So strong is this propensity of mankind to fall into animosities that where no substantial occasion presents itself, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. So we dress some of them in orange shirts and some of them in blue shirts, turn them loose on each other, and they'll uh, engage in unfriendly passions. So we wanted to present some empirical examples of that kind of behavior, drawing on important instances in which politics has changed significantly over the course of the 20th century. Uh, on the upper left is a map of Boston, Massachusetts in the 1930s. Uh, we did some secondary analysis of voting behavior in different precincts of Boston on the basis of the ethnic character of the neighborhoods, and it turns out that these voters in Boston were responding to the New Deal in very different ways depending upon whether they were Yankee or Irish or Italian or African American in ways that don't seem consistent with the idea that they were responding to policy changes, but do seem consistent with the idea that they were thinking about what happened and responding to what happened on the basis of their ethnic and social identities. Um, in the upper right, we have John Kennedy, who's famously a Catholic candidate for president in 1960, and as a result, generated hugely different voting patterns in the 1960 election uh, on the basis of whether people felt strongly about their identity as Catholics or Protestants. Uh, in this case, we have some survey data from 1958, before Kennedy even appeared on the scene as a presidential candidate, and looked at Republicans who uh, were Catholics as a function of whether they thought strongly about their identity as Catholics, whether they said in 1958 that their identity as Catholics was important to them. Uh, among those who said being Catholic didn't matter so much to them, uh, overwhelmingly they stuck with Richard Nixon. Among those who said their Catholic identity was powerful in 1958, overwhelmingly they switched and voted for Kennedy in 1960. Uh, the lower left is uh, the signing of the epic civil rights bill in 1965. The shift of the white southerners from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party over a series of decades is probably the most important uh, shift in partisan loyalties in the second half of the 20th century. Um, usually that's interpreted as a policy response to the Civil Rights Act and the various pieces of legislation that were associated with it. But what we show is that people's shift from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party seem to have much more to do with their sense of identity as white Southerners uh, 
than it did with their specific policy positions. So for example, if you look at people's views about school segregation, the people who were in favor of school segregation were shifting to the Republicans, as you might expect, but the people who opposed school segregation were also shifting to the Republicans at a rate not much different because what was important, in our view at least, was not the policy preference specifically, but rather the shifting sense of identity as white Southerners and what that meant. And then finally, in the bottom right, the case of abortion, where we have some long-term panel data and can follow people over time to see what happens as the Democratic and Republican parties take strong positions on the issue of abortion. In the case of women who on average feel more strongly about this issue than men do, uh, there's a good deal of movement, most of which reflects shifting parties in order to bring party identification into line with uh, views about the issue of abortion. In the case of men who on average feel less strongly about abortion, most of the movement is in views about abortion. So uh, men who are Democrats but pro-life become increasingly pro-choice, and men who are Republicans but pro-choice become increasingly pro-life rather than shifting their political views. And of course, there's identity politics going on in this election cycle as well. Uh, we didn't have the foresight to write about Trump. We had a chapter in our book at one point about Ross Perot. The idea was that these kinds of outsider candidates can emerge in lots of different circumstances. We thought people probably had lost interest in Perot by 2016, uh, but the idea that this kind of stuff is possible uh, is very much with us. So how do voters sound like they know what they're talking about? If you ask them, they say all kinds of stuff that sounds sensible. In our view, that mostly has to do with rationalization. What they do is they see the world in a way that's congenial with their social identities, their group loyalties, and their partisanship. So here's a picture that shows you people's perceptions of how close they are to the Republican Party and the Democratic Party as a function of their own ideological self-placement. So if everybody was seeing the world in a sensible way, we'd have two completely overlapping lines here that started in the lower left with people who were very liberal and who thought of themselves as closer to the Democratic Party, and then on the top right, people who are very conservative and think of themselves as closer to the Republican Party. You see not only is there a pretty significant gap between the two lines, but the people who are Republicans and think of themselves as liberal manage to convince themselves that the Republican Party is just as liberal, just as close to them as the Democratic Party is. And the people who are Democrats but conservatives manage to convince themselves that the Democratic Party is just as conservative as they are. They just wish away the inconsistency between their ideology and their partisanship. Here's another example with respect to a specific factual question. This is a question that was asked in 1996 after Bill Clinton had been in office for four years and presided over an 80% decrease in the federal budget deficit. So this was a pretty big deal, pretty important political fact. And survey respondents were asked whether the budget deficit had increased or decreased during Clinton's first term. So this is a kind of quiz question about whether they're willing to face the reality of what had happened over this period. One thing you see is that there's very little recognition of the fact that the budget deficit had declined through the, about the first two thirds or three quarters of the distribution of political information. So average people who are paying an average amount of attention to politics were more likely to get that wrong than they were to get it right. And the other thing to see here is that insofar as there's a difference between the parties throughout that whole range of the information distribution, what's happening is that as Republicans become better informed, they become more likely to get it wrong. So they're clued in enough to realize that it would be embarrassing to them if a Democratic president had presided over this huge decrease in the budget deficit, and so they simply deny that it happened. And as a result, you get a kind of balance between the weight that they're attaching to the reality of political change on one hand and their partisan wishes on the other hand, which until you get up to about the 85th percentile of the distribution in terms of political information is more heavily responsive to these partisan wishes than it is to what's actually happening out there in the world. And only at the very top do you find people who are responsive to this pretty big political fact. 
So what does all this add up to? Um, people often ask us, well, would you rather live in an authoritarian regime? The answer is no. Um, that was brought home to us when Princeton University Press uh, tried to arrange a deal to have our book translated into Chinese, and the Chinese came back with their point-by-point -point assessment of the things that we wouldn't be allowed to say in the Chinese translation, which uh, as a result is not gonna happen. Um, but here are some of the things that we think are important about democracy. One is that it provides a really pretty efficient way for everyone to agree on what happened. In a lot of countries, the result of the election is unclear. There's violence as a result. In the US, that almost never happens. Even if the election is decided by a party line vote in the Supreme Court, within a matter of weeks, most people are over it and on to something else. Um, this essential randomness that we've described in election outcomes prevents any single party or group from being in power for a very long time and entrenching themselves and uh, developing a level of corruption beyond uh, what would otherwise occur. Neglected groups, if they're not too unpopular, which is an important caveat, uh, are attractive targets for recruitment by one or both parties, and so democracies tend to be more inclusive than other political regimes. And re-election seeking politicians strive to avoid salient violations of consensual norms. So our example is that you don't see the president strangling a kitten on national television. That's a kind of constraint on power, but it's not a very uh, binding one in most circumstances. It doesn't cover most of the real important policy disputes. And so I wanna just leave you with this uh, long thought from a political theorist named John Donne. <laughs> to be ruled is both necessary and inherently discomforting as well as dangerous. For our rulers to be accountable to us softens its intrinsic humiliations, probably sets some hazy limits to the harms that they will voluntarily choose to do to us collectively, and thus diminishes some of the dangers to which their rule may expose us. To suggest that we can ever hope to have the power to make them act just as we would wish them to, suggests that it is really we, not they, who are ruling. This is an illusion, and probably a somewhat malign illusion either a self-deception or an instance of being deceived by others, or very probably both. That's the kind of problem that we wanna try and address. We haven't certainly addressed it fully here. Uh, our discussants will help us with that. Thank you. Okay, this is an incredibly rich book, which I recommend that everybody buy immediately if you haven't already done so. Um, and I just want to make a few points because I want to leave a lot of time for us to dig in. Um, but um, several years ago, um, two well-known political scientists declared democracy dead in the United States, calling the state we live in an oligarchy. And Democracy for Realists is an autopsy of democratic theory and practice in which the causes of the death of democracy are identified. Those include voter irrationality, ignorance, confusion, and manipulability. The authors lay blame for the pathology not with individuals, you're off the hook, um, who are often overwhelmed by the decisions that they need to understand, but with the democratic theorists who they argue champion unrealistic forms of politics. Uh, I not only agree with the spirit of the book, but I think that many of the Enlightenment philosophers who um, you didn't uh, mention during the talk, but you, I think you think let us down, uh, I think they actually agree with you. So for many thinkers, uh, the Enlightenment was a defense of individual rights and popular sovereignty, um, uh, um, but not um, a defense of the average person as a politically or potentially careful steward of the common good. It was a strident attack on absolute monarchs and the kind of ruling class dominance that you also reject. But many of democracy's most well-known defenders didn't hold Joe Public in very high esteem. And scattered throughout the history of political thought are people like Mill, who advocated for a harm principle that would allow the imposition of non-democratic forms of authority in circumstances where people might be likely to harm others. Many of our founders were stridently opposed to the excesses of the masses, and very few democratic theorists of the Enlightenment wanted unrestrained, direct mass democracy. Most believed in putting layers of distance between the people and the government. 
So some form of trusteeship is recommended at some point by almost all democratic thinkers. Most also share with this book the belief that a good deal of political power lies not with a random mass of individuals, but rather with various group alliances that inspire people to act on their attachments. One task of good constitutional design is to control the behavior of groups, but it's not a task we have a handle on yet. This raises a few questions in my mind that I hope can generate a little bit of discussion. And I'm kind of gonna um, tack between smaller points and larger points. Uh, but first, in your autopsy, you persuasively argue that there's no procedure that could have saved the patient. So you pretty briskly dismiss the idea of tinkering with electoral and institutional design as a means of compensating for the inadequacies of most voters. I'd like to know a little bit more, um, perhaps get you to say a little bit more about two institutional matters before I fully buy into the idea that procedures can't address at least some of what's wrong. So um, given how much you focus on the inability of people to see past what has happened immediately preceding an election, which I found really interesting, um, I wonder if there are procedural fixes that involve not more populism, um, but elections that are structured to account for temporal myopia. And in my own form of temporal myopia, I happen to have recently been reading Condorcet, who was both an empiricist um, and an Enlightenment liberal. And I'm not reading The Law of Aggregation, which you rightly critique, but his thoughts on constitutional design and his interest in the length of time that it takes people to make good decisions. You mentioned the timing issue, and you approvingly um, cite Nordhaus's suggestion that the duration of time between election matters, or between elections matters. But you, you kind of um, wave that one away. Alexander Hamilton, you mentioned too, was concerned with this question. And I kind of wonder why, if temporal myopia is such a problem, why we shouldn't consider whether the timing of elections and the duration of office holding can help voters put their interests into perspective. And then extending the institutional line of inquiry, inquiry, I also wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit to this um, kind of other side of the equation, and that is the qualifications to run for office. So if we know the electorate isn't qualified, um, it may be that they're not the only unqualified people that are part of this. Um, so voters may be ignorant, but we're social scientists, and we know how difficult it is to predict our economic futures. If it weren't, I would be doing like much better. Um, uh, my retirement fund would be. But um, there are very few qualifications for running for office. So if we're autopsying democracy, I'd like to know whether the absence of mechanisms to weed out poor stewards of the common good is partly to blame for the pathology. So voters have terrible choices. We know this so keenly right now, right? Um, politicians who often appeal to very base forms of group identities, which is your concern, without representing the interests of the members of those groups. And this has yielded things like the Southern strategy that appealed to working class white voters without doing them very much good, it would appear. <laughs> so doesn't the some of the fault lie with those who engineered and carried out this strategy for not giving their constituency better choices and for the political design that yielded that possibility? Then my second question. Although you discussed preferences and values um, a little bit in the first part of the book, I had I, at least the impression, it seemed to me, that you spend more time analyzing the inability of voters to understand and vote according to their economic interests and well-being. In the second half of the book, you talk about the degree to which it seems that people's preferences correlate with group identification, including, but not limited, to party ID. And the preferences, preferences you discuss seem largely related to values, a little bit more um, leaning towards values rather than interests, which you talked a lot about in the first part of the book. And I'm not sure which you actually think should be prioritized, um, or if you think that voters ought to be able to decide for themselves whether in a difficult situation they want to go with, with um, values or interests. But there's one form of group attachment that at least purports or attempts to ally the two, and that's social class. And um, the peculiarity of social class attachment, or the lack thereof, in the United States is a question that's vexed social scientists and historians for generations. And I know it's a subject that you've thought a lot about. It seems like the logical intersection of the two halves of the book, or the two kind of faces of the book. If we assume that people have to prioritize and they can't have everything, they can't have low taxes and secure social security and small government and guns and, and safe streets, is one of the implicit messages of the book that average Americans would be better off if they felt as strong an attachment to their social class as one percenters seem to feel to theirs. So if democracy for a realist is correct, its authors have made a case for paternalism of some sort, 
people who cannot be entrusted with the responsibilities of sovereignty need to be cared for by someone who does understand their interests. These few questions are geared towards better specifying what kind of paternalism we need um, or we want to put into place to better protect people's interests from their actual voting behavior. Um, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to turn it over to Matt now, who I think can tell us whether the citizenries of other democracies also need more paternalism. I think he thinks they do. Um, thanks, Shana, for inviting me to, to speak. I'm really honored to be part of this discussion. And uh, Elizabeth already said it. I'll say it again. This is a really important book. Uh, anyone in the audience, not just political science professors like me, but really anyone who considers himself or herself a responsible democratic citizen, you need to read this book. You'll never look at elections and democracy the same way again. Let me start with the most obvious point. Uh, Aiken and Bartel's criticism of what they call the folk theory is spot on, 100% accurate, and it's totally devastating. No reasonable person can still subscribe to the folk theory after reading the opening chapters of this book. But let me ask a question on this point. Why does the folk theory persist? Aiken and Bartels note that their own criticisms aren't exactly new. In fact, they carefully cite a century's worth of work that has methodically torn this theory to pieces, yet it persists. So when they refer to their own critique as the folk theory's funeral, Elizabeth called it an autopsy, uh, I want to agree with them, but I'm not sure if I can. I've been to this funeral too many times before. Um, and yet the folk theory lives on like a giant zombie roaming the earth wreaking havoc. Um, I wonder if our authors can uh, maybe have some plan in mind to finally put this theory out of its misery. All previous attempts have failed. Um, this can be hard news for some to take. There, um, a couple of uh, people have already spoken about the pessimistic um, uh, overtones of the book. I'll be a little bit more positive at the end. Um, uh, but, but it can be tough news to take the idea that our common understanding of how elections work is wrong. Uh, even harmful. And um, uh, Chris and Larry have made this case most effectively uh, with respect to the case of American democracy. Um, but I want to add an additional thought. There's already so much to talk about. We don't really have to um, go beyond the US, but I will. Um, if this were a book about comparative politics, a book about the impact of the folk theory in the developing world, in new democracies, or in countries that are allegedly transitioning to democracy, the implications would be far more serious and profoundly negative. I just got back a couple of days ago from Peru. They had national elections there this past Sunday, and the OAS invited me to serve as an electoral observer. Um, and what I observed there encapsulates the problem of the folk theory as applied to Peru and to many Latin American countries. Um, the elections were largely free and fair. The campaign lasted for several months. There were lots of campaign ads on TV, um, no bias in who gets to air their ads. The voting process was pretty well organized. Um, Peru even has mandatory voting. So I guess there, were, there, there wouldn't even be any significant turnout bias by class or, or gender or minority status or anything like that. So that's all great. Um, but Peru has a horribly incompetent and corrupt government. How can that be? It gets even more interesting. While there, I was surprised to observe that the government was running public service announcements straight out of the folk theory manual. There were billboards all over the place telling voters to ask politicians about their programs. I heard a radio ad that directly explained how each voter should learn about proposals and rationally consider their vote, because only if all citizens did so, would the elections produce a salutary outcome. In other words, based on the logic of the folk theory, the Peruvian government was telling its citizens that if they suffered from bad government, it was their own fault for not voting hard enough. Right? I think most Peruvians view this as a complete joke. Uh, the candidates hardly offer any proposals. Most of the slogans are totally vapid. Here's my favorite. Towards the future. Right? <laughs> as if there's anywhere else to go. 
even if they do offer a platform, nobody expects them to follow through on it. So to cut to the point, Peruvian voters, Latin American voters in general, are not stupid, and they can clearly see that elections do not, in fact, produce good government. In fact, a common joke in the region, which I've seen in movies, I've heard it in person, is that the real purpose of elections is simply to give people the option of choosing which set of thieves is going to rob them blind for the following four years. In new or weak democracies, the folk theory does real damage by creating false hope and cynicism about democracy and about politics in general. Of course, things are far worse in other parts of the world. Let's consider those iconic photos of Iraqis holding up their purple ink-stained fingers, indicating that they voted. I think most of those photos come from the 2005 election that empowered Nouri al-Maliki. What was your reaction when you saw those photos? I'll tell you mine. Uh, awe, pride, delight. I thought it was great. They had really done it. I couldn't believe it. They had a free and fair election. They must be on the threshold of being a true democracy. Eleven years later, sadly, we know better, don't we? I can share a similar story about Egypt. Uh, each spring, I give a series of lectures on democracy to a set of visiting fellows from the Middle East. In the spring of 2013, I had a conversation with one of these fellows, a pro-democracy activist from Egypt. Uh, Mohamed Morsi had just been elected the previous year. So the Egyptian was bragging about how democratic his country was, even more democratic than Israel, he said, because even the Christians could vote. Right? This time, my heart sank. Anyone following that situation knew that there was trouble on the horizon. Morsi had seized emergency powers a few months after being elected, and he was clearly moving to consolidate his own personal power and to emasculate the opposition. Soon enough, the military had enough of him, and we all know the rest of that story. What about Libya? The United States started pushing for elections even before Gaddafi had been deposed and killed in 2011. Both President Obama and Secretary Clinton spoke about elections as the centerpiece of Libya's impending transition to democracy. They congratulated the Libyans multiple times, in fact, on having achieved that democracy. How'd that work out? In divided societies, a naive focus on holding elections is likely to produce chaos. And by the way, uh, the group theory, the social identity theory that Aiken and Bartels um, discuss in the latter part of the book, isn't likely to provide a solution for countries like Iraq or Egypt. Um, if, in fact, their group theory of political behavior is accurate, um, then the implications for democracy in divided societies like Iraq are even worse than we might have imagined. Um, uh, Chris and Larry don't have a complete explanation for how group theory could produce democratic government here in the US. So please don't ask me to explain how it could do so for Egypt or Iraq. And needless to say, in a stateless or near stateless country like Libya, the situation is even worse yet. Asking political actors to focus on a general election when there isn't even a functioning state to govern with is a cruel joke. Doesn't anyone in the State Department read Huntington anymore? I don't want you to misunderstand my point. I reject the argument that some countries can't handle democracy, aren't ready for democracy, that their cultures and histories are just incompatible with democratic institutions. In my view, that's nonsense. But the problem is that democracy requires so much more than elections, things like functioning states, the rule of law, checks and balances, and so on. And to be fair, uh, the people who promote democracy in places like Latin America, the Middle East, other regions, often recognize that a more comprehensive approach is needed. But on too many occasions, widespread adherence to the folk theory has led democracy promoters to push a naive narrative centered on the power of elections. It's hard to come to terms with this. And obviously, there's a serious debate to be had here. But let me go ahead and say it. In many cases, democracy promotion has done more harm than good. And the Aiken Bartels theoretical framework helps us to understand why. How's that for negative? Um, but is there some good news? Uh, let, me, let me finish up real quickly with one additional thought that uh, might give that glimmer of hope that uh, some of us have been uh, asking about. Um, 
and, and Elizabeth mentioned this too, but I'll, I'll, I'll go over it real quickly, and maybe I see it a little bit differently than her. Um, uh, Chris and Larry clearly reject uh, the folk theory of elections, but if I understand their argument correctly, um, the, the reason that, we're, that Elizabeth is saying democracy is dead and we're, we're re reviewing the autopsy, that kind of thing, is that they don't want to do away with the democratic ideal that underlies it. Um, in other words, they agree that political institutions should be judged by the degree to which they produce p policy outcomes that are responsive to the needs or interests of a majority of their citizens. So in the, in the conclusion of their book, uh, Aiken and Bartels lament that America is a democracy but it is not very democratic. By this, I take them to mean that America is a country that uses elections to hire and fire uh, its political leaders, but that those leaders don't produce policies that are in some sense good, fair, public-spirited, or democratic. That's fine, but let's step back a little bit and, and put this majoritarian impulse in its proper context. Um, if American democracy is not as responsive as we think it should be, at least one reason, surely, is intentional design, right? So we have a, an appointed Supreme Court. We used to have an appointed Senate. Uh, we have a dispersion of power, system of checks and balances, super majoritarian obstacles to fundamental political change, and this is all by design. Um, the founders were very clear on this. They understood the potential dangers of the democratic impulse, and they wanted to control it. Um, and so this complicates the story a little bit um, for, um, for our authors. They remain completely correct about the empirical evidence. The folk theory is a failure. Um, but there's room for debate about the normative implications because elections aren't really the only thing that we should be concerned about. Uh, elections in the US don't work as advertised. But all things considered, the US has a pretty good government anyway. I can't believe I just said that out loud. Um, <laughs> But, but that's because I study other parts of the world. Elections in some other parts of the world don't work as advertised either. But their governments are horrible. Right? So clearly, there have to be other political institutions that might explain this difference. And so to close, I think it would be worth thinking more about what those institutions are, how they support democracy in the US, and how they might improve democracy promotion efforts in other parts of the world. Thank you. I'm happy to go to questions. One of the one of the real pleasures of listening to colleagues who come from other parts of the profession than our own is that they know a great deal that we don't know, and so we very much profited from these two these two sets of, uh, of, of comments, and uh, we're most grateful. Thanks. Okay, so we'll open it for questions now. So if you have a question, um, raise your hand, and uh, people who will come around. Um, Eric, could you uh, just make sure that you're raising your hand? OK, Go hi. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask the authors about the role of the media, especially. I'm, I'm a journalism major, and <laughs> I am proud myself for choosing a profession that informs citizens about the issues going on in, in, in concerning the government. So since I would say fairly after 1990s, because of the internet and the rise of the social media in the early 2000s, the, the increase in the inform, inc there's def definitely an increase in an information flow so on to inform the citizens about these issues so if you reject if your book rejects folk theory um, I just wanted to ask um, doesn't this increase in the information flow make citizens more educated about the issues and thus support the folk theory um, there's an interesting analysis of this by Chris's colleague, Marcus Pryor, who studies mostly pre-internet, but generally the expansion of the news media and the volume of media content. And it turns out to go two ways. There's a set of people who are interested in politics and motivated to pay attention, who now have access to much more political information than they did in the past. On the other hand, there's a much larger group of people who 
aren't all that into politics and who 30 years ago would have been forced to watch a half hour of news every night because that was the only thing that was on all three of the available networks. And now they can pay attention to game shows and gardening and pornography and the stuff that's really important to them. And so the <laughs> effect seems to be an increasing variance of political information, but actually no increase at all in terms of the average level. So the people in this room are disproportionately in that first category who are happy to have access to a lot more information than they did in the past. But for the society as a whole, it's most cases, it seems not to have been very helpful. I think much of the problem here is that the media present politics in a way that's consistent with the folk theory and shovel information to citizens about every conceivable policy issue and imagine that that's what they need in order to cast intelligent votes. And so I think they're very much in the thrall of this mistaken model that we're pointing to about what democracy ought to involve. They don't like repetition, which would make their role in the political process a lot more effective if they engaged in more of it. They don't like being judgmental, which would be helpful to citizens who just want to know what side they should be on. Um, and they don't focus a lot on the connections between civil society, group attachments and loyalties on one hand and their implications for politics on the other. So mostly they present issues as having you know, a right side and a wrong side rather than a side that's right for me and a side that's right for him. So uh, I was wondering, I have a, a class where we study the um, modern American presidency, and one of the um, thoughts we've studied is uh, strategic competence for the president. So I guess as a voter, what do you think maybe that could play into it, whereas a voter can't know the in-depth you know, understanding of every issue, and the voter might need to focus on a couple and then kind of rely on you know, the norm or go a certain way with some other ones. Do you feel that maybe voters do that now or do you think that could be a, a way to trim down all of the information or all of the different ideas that happen with every presidential election and, you know, obviously in Congress as well? There, there are certainly a great many voters who monitor one or two things. And the challenge, and, and are very much connected to often to the interest groups that help them monitor it and tell them what they should be thinking. The difficulty, we think, is that uh, this is single issue voting and it's often quite disconnected from the rest of what's going on. So it's a very narrow slice of what the, in, uh, what the incumbent has done and as a result you get odd <laughs> kinds of distortions often. In, in addition, your, those voters are not escaping our criticisms of the folk theory. They are taking advice typically from interest groups that, that monitor this. And the interest groups that have a megaphone and a bully pulpit can make themselves heard. And other interest groups that might be more important to the voters' welfare don't, do not necessarily have one. So uh, what you're pointing to is important, I think, but uh, it is not, we think, the the, the way to think about democracy that makes it be okay in, in the end. It's just too, it's just too small, a, too small a chunk of what's going on. Good evening, thank you for your insights. I'm curious about your opinion on public participation that occurs outside the elections, like town halls, hearings, committees. At least theoretically, it seems to overcome some of the deficiencies of elections. You mentioned, for example, it, the frequency is much more often, and theoretically, participants can be provided, supplied with necessary information. Thank you. Do you want this one there? Um, <clears throat> I've done some attempts to understand how participation actually affects what public officials do. And there seems to be some connection between the kinds of participatory acts that you're talking about and 
actual policy outcomes, um, mostly for things like having direct contact with elected officials. Um, one downside of that is that the part of the populace that elected officials spend their time talking to is a very small and rather distorted part of the overall society. And so I think they are responsive to those kinds of informal communications in a way that probably doesn't tend to produce responsiveness to, to what we would think of as the interests of the population as a whole. But I think it depends a lot on the social context, who's participating, what the expectations are about what affects it as. So, for example, when Matt Cleary looks at Mexico, he finds that having competitive elections doesn't do much to help in terms of producing government services that people need, but having a participatory culture in which people complain to the local officials when they can't get access to safe water probably makes more of a difference because they do seem to be sensitive to those kinds of um, interventions from the public, but in ways that the standard theory of democracy with elections and political accountability doesn't account for very well. There's a, if I could just add briefly there, there's another um, uh, version of the argument that you're making, and I don't know how sympathetic you are to it, but a lot of political theorists are actually just as dismissive of elections as we are, but they want to replace it with deliberative democracy and meetings of meetings of people that where you would get more information and, and that sort of thing. Elizabeth uh, referred a bit to this to this line of thought. And the, the, this is uh, certainly an interesting theoretical possibility. We think it's not easy to do in practice. People just don't want to go to that many meetings. They're too bored with politics even to vote and in, in almost half the cases in the country, and to make them go to a series of meetings and get lectures from experts and so forth, uh, we think is not very practical. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, being here today. Uh, I'm really seeking more of an opinion, um, piggybacking off of pretty much what she said in reference to citizens' um, relationships towards their government, particularly on a local level. Um, I haven't read your book, <laughs> but what are your opinions about elected officials after the elections once they're inside of the House and the power that they actually have to carry out the issues that they ran on? because there is an internal power structure that happens within government. I'm not sure if you cover that in your book, but what are your thoughts on that, about the actual power that the people we vote for have when, once they're inside? Well, I guess I would say I think they have more power to do some things than others, um, and at different levels of government and in different contexts, they may have more ability to make a difference that will actually affect people's well-being. Um, the difficulty, I think, is that unless you can imagine that people understand the constraints and understand when they should or shouldn't expect elected officials to be able to make that kind of difference, it's very hard to know how they would gauge what kinds of demands they ought to make on elected officials and what kinds of um, outcomes they should attempt to hold them responsible for. Um, a lot of times the problem is that elected officials are campaigning on the basis of symbols and sympathy and uh, trying to convince people that they're going to do what they can for them without getting a lot into the details of what they can or can't do. I think for the most part, they, more than we often think, attempt to, once they're in office, to accomplish what they say they're going to accomplish. So, in that picture I showed with the Republicans and the Democrats, they're behaving very differently even when they're in similar districts because they have real ideological convictions about what's good for the country and what's good for their constituents. I think that determines much more of their behavior than we often think. Um, but all of that is outside of this theory we have in which the voters are sending subtle signals about exactly what they want in the way of policy.
Hi. Uh, so thank you again. And also, uh, in reference to how some like, elected officials aren't being responsive, uh, I was wondering how you thought about how gerrymandering obviously has gotten more attention over the past 20 years, how you get districts that are essentially make almost safe officials where to this idea where they get elected and they can almost act in any way regardless of what the voters want because the threat will either come from their own party more to the left or right or not at all. Um, so I was wondering if that too played an effect to uh, creating this unresponsiveness to elected officials. I guess I have a narrow and then a broader reaction. The narrow reaction is that Gerrymandering is certainly a bad thing, but I think it's overblown in terms of its importance. Much of the, un, much of the safeness of congressional districts, especially, has much more to do with changes in the geography of where Democrats and Republicans live rather than conscious efforts to make districts <coughs> safe. In fact, at this point, there are a lot of parts of the country where you would have to go to a lot of trouble to make districts unsafe. Um, but more generally, I think the safeness of districts is not the main issue here. Again, if you think back to that graph, the people who are running in districts that are quite competitive, sometimes the Democrat gets elected and acts absolutely like a Democrat. Sometimes the Republican gets elected and acts absolutely like a Republican. And so in a sense, they're completely disenfranchising half of their voters, where at least in a safe Republican district, most of the citizens are going to be on board with what this Republican legislator is doing and similarly on the Democrat side. So it's not obvious to me that if we had a lot of very marginal districts that the overall quality of representation would be improved in some sense. Yeah, so we'll go here and then back here. Um, thanks again for coming. And my question regards with the upcoming uh, Republican convention, <laughs> uh, without getting into like the partisan politics of it, what do you think the implications for our democracy are uh, based off all the different outcomes that could be um, somebody that no votes were cast in their name at all uh, or somebody that was very clearly not winning any of those outcomes? What are those implications for our, the health of our democracy? Well, I can say a little bit about that. One of the arguments you're hearing now from uh, on, in both parties, actually, is that any choice at the convention other than the candidate who got the most votes in the primaries would be undemocratic. And what they mean would is that it would be the most folk undemocratic. What they don't mean is that it would necessarily uh, not be in people's interest to, uh, in the party and in the country, to go to a choice that has a better chance to, to win in November. So the concrete issue that arises here is superdelegates and the role of superdelegates and whether superdelegates are undemocratic. So for those of you who have, haven't followed the details here, there are people at the conventions who are not elected in primaries, who are representatives of the party machinery. And the irony here is that the Republicans have fewer superdelegates than the, than the Democrats do. And I, my guess is the reason for that is Republicans think we are sane and not crazy like Democrats. We don't need superdelegates. And then, then a bad thing happens. So the, <clears throat> the circumstance they are in right now is that for most party officials, the two leading candidates for the party nomination are extremely dangerous candidates for Republicans. That is to say, they're likely, uh, all else equal, you never know what'll happen, but all else equal, they're likely to lead to disasters for the party in November, the big losses that would put the Democrats in power for a long time. But they don't have any easy way to, they don't have any easy way to do anything about it. Uh, we may get a brokered convention, I don't know. But what the part of our book that is relevant to this is the notion that the way that we pick party nominees should be just straight plebiscitary democracy. Uh, as Larry remarked in his, uh, in, in his discuss initial opening discussion, that we didn't do it that way for the vast majority of our history. It really took until the 70s before this was changed. Before that, we had the kind of system that the uh, 
founders would have approved of, that, that James Madison would have approved of, and that is one in which there was a balance of popular preferences and also people who actually know these, know these candidates. Um, James Madison was a product of my department, he was an undergrad in my department, so was Ted Cruz. Um, <laughs> I leave it to you whether, it, you know, things have gone downhill. Uh, <laughs> the the um, <coughs> judgment, the judgment of, Sorry. The, the judgment of people who really know these people it, and, and have worked with them and have some sense of whether they should be the next president, and, and by these people I mean everyone who's running for, for, the, for the presidency, in our view should get some weight. And, in, and just because that's the way the Constitution works, that's the way the Federalist Papers work, it's as American as apple pie. So the idea that, that superdelegates should get zero weight and shouldn't be part of this, of this process seems to us to be a conceptual blunder. It's not, that's not, getting rid of them isn't, isn't real democracy at all. Um, we need, we need superdelegates, and I think in particular Republicans need more than they have. On. Can you hear me? Okay, this is more in regards to what um, you said, Professor Cleary, towards the end of um, your talk. Um, you, but of course, any, for anybody who'd like to answer it, you mentioned that elections aren't the only thing we should be concerned about, that political institutions are what um, affect how <coughs> elections materialize. Um, that kind of made me think, though, that I don't know if you could speak more about this or if anybody could, but my take is that institutions are enmeshed and entrenched in the politics that create them. And so um, how, where is the line between, um, you mentioned that they support democracy and kind of push against the current of um, undemocratic elections, but I would kind of trouble that or maybe ask how, what you think about the extent to which political institutions perpetuate the deficiencies of the politics that they exist in rather than um, push against that. Thanks. Um, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. I don't, I don't want to monopolize the time, but I guess I'll just say that, um, y you know, Larry, towards the end of the talk, gave a little bit about, well, elections don't do this, but they do do some things, right? So um, a regular peaceful transfer of power. Um, keeping one party from being in power for too long, these kinds of things. So um, we're, we're really focused here on the negatives, in part because this folk theory, just people won't let it go. And, and I think it's a really um, salutary effort to try to coax people to, to let that go, because it's false. Um, but that doesn't mean that elections serve no purpose, right? Um, and, uh, you know, a, as Larry said at the end of the talk, well, he's not really looking forward to moving to communist China anytime soon because, the, because our, our government uh, is a democracy and we do get a lot of things right. Um, and, and so what I had in mind when I talked about other political institutions are things like, um, you know, a professional civil service, transparency laws. Um, you know, the rule of law, impartial court systems. You could go on and on and name them. And so uh, it's a mistake to think that elections are going to, uh, as we've said, guide the ship of state in some kind of fine-tuned way. But if those other institutions are in place, then when elections, for whatever random set of reasons, result in um, person A or person B being in power, at least those supporting institutions can um, can encourage good behavior and constrain bad behavior when they're in office. And that's something that the United States has um, that many Latin American democracies or democracies in, in the developing world lack. And that's the real difference, right? They all have bad elections, right? Um, but but the, the other institutional features are different. Yeah, China has elections too. <laughs> Um, we're going to take the microphones here and then you can ask <coughs> questions in turn.
respond to them together, and then we're going to wrap up and, and thank our speakers. Yes. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I found it interesting that you said that illusion um, is some, like we have the illusion that we can change things, but by that, by thinking that way, it's actually the ruling class being in charge of us, which made me think of this uh, Marxist philosopher called Louis uh, Althusser. I don't know how to say it. Althusser. Yeah, yeah, and he says something similar with ideology that's an illusion to reality, and that you can't really step outside ideology. And a way to do it is to step outside your own, yourself and your identity. But people don't really want to do that because it's depressing. And like, <laughs> it, like in Mexico with elections, they give out so many free things and people love that. They don't care if the, polit the politics are corrupt. So how do you actually get someone to push themselves to do something like that, even if it's scary? Great. And then we'll end. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I, I look at the dysfunction in, um, in Washington, D.C. sort of uh, through an economic and moral lens. So uh, I believe the root of every problem in America is, is because of capitalism. I mean, our country was founded on a slave-based economy. Uh, but I believe that capitalism promotes indivi uh, individuality and um, competition, not cooperation and teamwork. So um, you know, everybody is playing catch up with white America, in my opinion, given how our country was founded. And, and, uh, and, the, and the harsh realities of our history. So when we talk about how do we make major progress, major long-term sustainable progress um, uh, with our political system and how they can start reflecting um, uh, the people, not corporate America, for example, we need to be able to be willing to be engaged in um, a mighty struggle because there's not gonna be mighty gains without mighty struggle. I think white America has a lot of privilege that it will need to sacrifice and give to everybody else in order for us to make real change. And I believe that capitalism doesn't, doesn't work. I think it's inherently unequal uh, in our country. So in order to be, for there to be a level playing field, I believe the federal government has to play a role in a socialistic sort of way to level the playing field for everybody sort of what Bernie Sanders is uh, talking about. So where do you view economics and, mor and morality in terms of what our political system is about right now? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, the way we think about this is partly as a demonstration that the folk theory is wrong, right? Because if it was correct, all we'd need is for everyone to have access to the vote and communicate their preferences and politicians would be forced to pay attention. Um, there are some problems still in terms of access to the ballot, but most of those problems have been solved over the course of the last 200 years in the American system. Uh, there are differences in rates of turnout as a function of economic classes, but they're relatively small by comparison with what seems to be the disparity in influence of different kinds of people in the governmental process. And that suggests to us that the elections are not really what governs the behavior of elected officials. And there's this complex of persuasion and bargaining that goes on in which lots of other resources that don't figure in the standard theory of democracy play a very important role. I'll just add that uh, all of this seems to work in very much the same way in socialist political systems, or at least in systems that call themselves socialist. And so it isn't obvious to me that the picture would be fundamentally different um, in that context than in the context we're in, although obviously there are differences in magnitude uh, with respect to these issues. Uh, both of these questions are deep and serious questions, and it's a little bit insulting for us to re reply to each of you in 60 seconds, uh, but that's all the time bec because you raise deep problems. I'll, I'll let Larry's response to you stand, even though uh, there's a great deal more to say. With respect to the question you asked, a book that you might find helpful is um, 
Karl Mannheim's ideology and utopia, he talks specifically about this issue of getting outside your, uh, outside your identity and how hard that is for most people. And he thinks there's a special role for intellectuals, which I would translate as well-educated people who have time to give this a little thought. And I do think there is a, there is a special role for the people in this room as, as well as the people at the front of the, of the room to think a little bit about the ways in which we can transcend the particular details of whatever, whatever groups and identities we may have been born into and to think more, more broadly about ways in which we can bring groups together in, in ways that uh, Matt was talking about, that, that if it's all just identity politics and the clashes of people who don't talk to each other and nobody can, nobody can see past that, uh, politics is going to be difficult. So I think most, as you said, most people aren't going to be able to do this. It might be that there's a special role here, one that we don't think about for ourselves, in which we do some thinking about how to bring different identities together and how to transcend our own limitations to the extent that we can. Well, please join me in thanking our speakers today and then join us outside for a few seconds.